Hey guys, so today's video is all about DeSoto. I made a video a few weeks ago talking about the Plymouth brand and its cancellation, and I saw that some of you guys wanted me to do DeSoto as well, so that's what we're going to cover today. First we'll look at the history about the brand, and then that will lead us into their cancellation and the reasons for that. I also want to go over a list of DeSoto production vehicles and concept cars at the end of the video, so let's jump right into it. Walter Chrysler founded DeSoto on August 4th of 1928, first introducing these vehicles for the 1929 model year. Chrysler wanted to enter one of their brands to compete with Oldsmobile, Buick, Studebaker, Hudson, and Willys, which were all in the mid-level price class. The brand was named after Hernando de Soto, who was a Spanish explorer in the 1500s. He is best known for leading the first Spanish and European expedition deep into what is now the modern-day United States, through Florida, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and Arkansas. He was also the first European documented as having crossed the Mississippi River. De Soto was born in 1495 in Extremadura, Spain, and he would die in 1542 at the age of 46 on the banks of the Mississippi River in what is now Ferry Day, Louisiana. That's also why the DeSoto logo usually had an image of an explorer to resemble Hernando. I've also found that there are many negative things that he did as well, but this video is not the time or the place to discuss those controversies. So getting back to the cars, 500 dealers were instantly attracted and that went up to 1500 by the end of the year. So that meant for the first year of DeSoto in 1929, a record breaking 81,065 vehicles were produced, and that record would stand until the 1964 Falcon sold more in its first year. DeSoto was targeted at a new segment of customers that had emerged since the end of World War I, younger, hipper, and more affluent. These were also one of the first cars marketed exclusively to women. The very first DeSoto was a six-cylinder with 55 horsepower, and it came with many features like an oil filter, lock-keyed hydraulic brakes, standard automatic windshield wipers, ignition lock, brake lights, an instrument panel, controls for the headlights, and a toolkit with a grease gun. Many of these features were either optional or not even offered by the other car manufacturers, so this DeSoto was seen as a bargain. The early names chosen were meant to evoke the passion associated with their Spanish namesake, like the Roadster Español, Sedan de Lujo, and Coupe de Lujo. In 1930, DeSoto brought out the top-of-the-line DeSoto CF Deluxe, or DeSoto 8, which had a larger 114-inch wheelbase and an inline 8-cylinder engine with 70 horsepower. DeSoto marked it as, quote, the world's lowest priced straight eight that had a vast reserve of power when you need it, end quote. 20,075 of these eights were built for 1930, most selling for around $995. When Chrysler purchased the Dodge Brothers, it would create a bit of a clash, as both the brands were mid-priced. In those early years, Chrysler priced the DeSotos a little less than the Dodges, and by 1932, both brands were selling nearly 25,000 vehicles a year. Chrysler tried to keep DeSoto exciting and relevant by having publicity stunts. One in 1932 where race car driver Peter DePaolo raced across the US in 10 days, and another where race car driver Harry Hartz drove the thing backwards across the US in 1933. Also in 1933, Chrysler decided to switch up Dodge and DeSoto, making the Dodge models cheaper to try to boost their sales. In 1934, Chrysler gave DeSoto the airflow body. If you remember that weird backwards drive across the country, Chrysler found that during that, the cars moved more efficiently through the air with the body reversed. The airflow was supposed to be a radical change, giving it better gas mileage and aerodynamics, and in some ways it was. There were no more freestanding pieces like spare tires, headlights, or taillights, just a smooth body arched throughout the vehicle. The interior was moved 20 inches forward, while the engine was moved between the front wheels instead of behind them. So that put passengers between the wheelbase and it reversed the traditional weight distribution, creating a much smoother ride. And that's something that most modern cars have followed since. That airflow would set 32 stock car records, most of which were about speed at the time, which you can see on screen. It also got great gas mileage, averaging 21.4 mpg on a 3,000 plus mile trip that cost only $33.06 in gas. Walter Chrysler would also make the cover of Time magazine, where he was asked, quote, Do you think the public is ready for anything so radical? End quote. He responded by saying, quote, I know the public is always ready for what it wants, and the public is always able to recognize genuine improvement. End quote. Unfortunately, that wasn't fully true for the airflow, as while it was a success overseas in Europe, where many manufacturers copied the airflow design, the American customers still disliked the unorthodox styling, and sales went down by 47% to just 13,940 airflows for 1934. Without other models to fall back on, Chrysler revised it and released the 1935 Airstream design, cancelling the airflow in 1936. 
In 1939, Chrysler spent $15 million on dyes and retooling of their models, and a few million of that went to DeSoto. They called their new look Hollywood style and added an adjustable front seat, gear shift lever on the steering column, and a super finish to engine parts to increase their lifespan. The 1939 was a big success with 54,449 vehicles built. DeSoto added a major styling element in 1941, the waterfall grille, that would stand the test of time for the next 15 years or so on these vehicles. It was kind of like a toothy grille that tumbled down the bumper. There were also airflow headlight covers that were well received, and a new semi-automatic transmission. Almost 100,000 DeSotos were built in the early 1940s. That 1942 model is one of the most memorable of the entire DeSoto history. Civilian production was put on hold in 1942, as DeSoto joined the war efforts to produce Sherman tank parts, Martin B-26 Marauder fuselage sections, B-29 Super Fortress nose sections, Navy Helldiver wing sections, and Beaufort anti-aircraft gun parts. After wartime restrictions on automotive production ended in late 1945, DeSoto reissued their 1942 models as 1946 models, but without the hidden headlight feature. The models included the Deluxe and Custom, with various trim levels like station wagons and convertibles. DeSoto would hit another home run in 1950 with a hardtop that they called the Sportsman, a new trim level for the Custom. Going forward, DeSoto would release various Sportsman trims under different model names. These were basically convertibles with solid tops that you could not retract. They had a unique look with a wraparound rear window, V-shaped rear roof pillars, wide white wall tires, full wheel covers, and interior perks as well. The sales hit their peak in 1949, as the Soto sold 133,854 cars, a record high for them that they would never match again. During the late 1940s and early 1950s, Cadillac, Chrysler, and Oldsmobile released new V8 engines, creating a horsepower race. The Soto would enter that race as well with their 276 cubic inch Fire Dome Hemi head engine, and they put that engine in a car with the same name. This was fairly impressive with 160 horsepower, a top speed of 100 miles per hour, and it would also cut down DeSoto 0 to 60 times by a full 4 seconds, all with more horsepower per cubic inch displacement than any other motor available. It's funny to think that this original 4,120 pound fire dome could do 0 to 60 in 15.5 seconds, which would be the slowest car on the road by today's standards. 45,830 fire domes were built, but the production was still falling, from that 133,854 in 1949, to 106,000 by 1951, and to 88,000 in 1952. DeSoto restyled their models in 1953, making them longer, wider, and sleeker. Now DeSoto had great styling to go along with the Hemi-powered engines. Some models after that included the Fire Sweep and Fire Flight, the latter of which was the new top-of-the-line V8 in 1955. The fully loaded sedans cost around $3,100 US, and DeSoto's sales had rose back up again to almost 132,000 for 1955. When talking about styling, it's also a must to talk about designer Virgil Exner, a key cog in the DeSoto web. I'll keep it short since he could get a video just about him alone, but he became GM's youngest ever design chief in his late 30s, and then he was hired by Chrysler to run the Advanced Design Studio by 1950. Shortly after that, a new president was hired as KT Keller, the man who hired Virgil, was replaced by Lester L. Tex Colbert. He gave Virgil free reign to build 18 different concept cars for Chrysler, called Idea Cars at the time, built on Chrysler, Dodge, Plymouth, and DeSoto chassis. He also created the forward look for Chrysler. For many years, the automotive design had been focused around the engine, but with this design, the whole car literally seemed to leap forward. It was available on the Dodge and Plymouths, but it really looked exceptional on the Chryslers and DeSotos. 1956 would see a huge decline in the auto industry, where Oldsmobile, Buick, Pontiac, Dodge, and Chrysler all experienced major losses in sales from the previous years. However, for some reason, DeSoto didn't follow that trend, and sales really didn't fluctuate much for them. That year saw them release a new performance coupe called the Adventurer, and the car would be a pace car at the Indianapolis 500 for the first and last time in the brand's history. The Adventurer couldn't be matched in terms of power and top speed by anything else, whether that be a Corvette or a Thunderbird. It had a 320 horsepower Hemi, came fully loaded with power steering, brakes, seats, windows and wipers, and had many other features. The original selling price was $3,678, which was $576 less than the base Chrysler 300, and it did have comparable performance and a better power-to-weight ratio. 
The designer Virgil Exner had another hugely successful design with the 1957 DeSotos, with huge tail fins, triple lens rocket launcher taillights, all in a slimmer package, emulating something from the space age. Chrysler would add a 345 horsepower, 345 cubic inch engine, and a 3-speed torque flight automatic transmission. That 1957 model year marked the largest lineup ever for DeSoto, with the Adventurer, Convertible and Hardtop, Fire Sweep with three trims, and Fire Flight in the Coupe, Convertible and Station Wagon form. That led to a very decent year, with DeSoto selling 117,514 units. The Fire Dome was also improved around this time, with an optional 305 horsepower 361 cubic inch V8, resulting in a 0 to 60 of 7.7 seconds and a top speed of 115 miles per hour. Even though we just went over how DeSoto had a successful 1957, that was also the start of their demise. First off, there was a recession, so the unemployment rate had been rising, up to 6.2% in 1958, which meant that according to my calculations, that's 10.84 million Americans unemployed. Many mid-range price vehicles and their manufacturers were hit hard, like GM, Chrysler, and DeSoto. Other companies died altogether, like Hudson and Nash. Chrysler had many quality control issues that were later discovered, resulting in many poorly built vehicles. Especially with DeSoto, they were unprepared for the demand that they received, resulting in plant capacity maxing out. Chrysler tried to speed up the assembly lines and build cars faster, but that caused tons of problems. Many hardtops leaked into the rain, letting more water in than out, and the leaks would extend to the windshields and rear windows. There were issues with transmissions, power steering units, broken torsion bars, splitting upholstery, flaking paint and radiators, often needing multiple replacements in the same vehicle for the same part. There were severe premature rusting on many vehicles as well. Chrysler also embarrassed themselves by offering a $600 performance boost to the Adventurer, which added 10 horsepower up to 355 with Bendix electronic fuel injection. Unfortunately, that system didn't work in basically every single vehicle, and all of them had to be recalled and fixed. Things got so bad that Chrysler had to shut down the assembly line for an entire week just to try to fix things properly. These issues proved to be a double-edged sword among DeSoto customers. The loyal DeSoto people were used to high-quality vehicles, so this angered that group of people, and as for the new customers, they were turned off by the issues and wouldn't return in the subsequent years. The designers, including Virgil, were not ready to give up just yet though. Virgil kept building prototypes, including another concept convertible with the forward look, no fins, just smooth and sculpted body lines. That concept would actually get approved for the 1962 model year. Virgil was such a role model that Chrysler got their other brands to draw inspiration from him and his DeSoto designs. DeSoto kept trying to improve in 1959, offering the Fire Sweep, Fire Dome, and Fire Flight in a whopping 26 different color variations, or 190 two-tone combinations. Even with that happening, Chrysler's special car committee began developing compact cars, such as the Plymouth Valiant, and began giving DeSoto's development, sales, and management resources to the other brands, which they thought would be more viable and profitable in the longer term. Basically, DeSoto was tanking. Just to recap a bit, 1955 saw sales of 115,485 from the Fire Dome and Fire Flight. That dropped to 109,422 in 1956, but rose back up to 117,514 in 1957. That was the year of the quality control issues, so sales really suffered, dropping 57.9% to just 49,445 for the next year in 1958, and Chrysler themselves lost over $40 million that year. Things didn't improve, as the sales kept dropping in 1959 to just 45,724. Chrysler also removed DeSoto from the Wyoming Avenue assembly plant for the first time since 1936 and shifted them over to the Jefferson Avenue. Sales for 1960 dropped another 57% to only 26,081. The 1960 DeSoto lineup reflected those poor sales. The Fire Sweep and Fire Dome names were dropped, as were all the station wagons and convertibles. The Adventurer became a Fire Flight, and the Fire Flight replaced the Fire Dome. Still, some improvements did come out, like unibody construction shared with Chrysler vehicles, better build quality, and a 7-step rust-proof process. The final year in 1961 got another facelift, and these models shared body shells and many other parts with various Chrysler models, obviously to keep costs down on a model that wouldn't sell very much. They made just 3,034 vehicles with those spare parts for the final year. There wasn't even a model name offered, it was just called a DeSoto, and you could choose either a 2-door or 4-door hardtop, 
and both the models shared a unique front end, prominent badging on the front grille and trunk lid, full-length chrome spears on the sides, and both used a 122-inch wheelbase. The 1961 dealer brochure was almost begging customers to buy the vehicle. I'll post that on screen. So by this time, there had been rumors for years about DeSoto getting cancelled. Those 1961 models went on sale October 14, 1960, but there was a lot of negative press. Motor Trend wrote an article in November 1960 saying, quote, Many observers seriously doubted whether DeSoto would introduce any car, let alone a new car for 1960. Generally speaking, most persons thought that if the car did come out, it would be a luxury compact, end quote. Sales for the first 30 days were really poor, prompting Chrysler to finally decide to end the DeSoto production on November 30th, 1960. On screen you can see the letter, sent by telegram to all the dealers by E.C. Quinn, letting them know that DeSoto was getting cancelled. The last DeSoto rolled off the assembly line at the Jefferson Avenue assembly plant on November 29th of 1960, and after 32 years and over 2 million vehicles produced, DeSoto was gone. So that's the end of the video guys, before I go I do want to show a list of passenger cars on screen so you can have an idea of some of the DeSoto vehicles released. I'll show a quick picture for each along with the name and years produced. That's the end of the video guys, hopefully you enjoyed it. Were you a big DeSoto fan and did you ever own any models? Or did you even hear about this brand before this video if you were a younger person? Let me know down in the comment section below. Thanks for watching, make sure to like and subscribe for all your Mopar content and I'll see you in the next video.